Mishpacha, it's Courtney, America's Jewish Mother. Welcome back to my channel. It's Friday, so that means it's time for another Friday Reads video, and I finished five books this week, so let's just get right into it. Um, the first book that I finished was The Body Is Not An Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. I read this as an ebook, so I don't have it here to all up and show you, but I'll put the title and stuff over here. Um, and this is actually the inaugural pick for my local yoga studios book club that they've started. Um, so we're going to discuss it, uh, I think, toward the end of the month. Um, and as implied by the title, it is a nonfiction book about how your body is not an apology, and it's about body positivity and self-acceptance and radical self-love, which is a phrase that gets repeated a lot in this book. Um, I ended up giving it three stars. I like the concept of it, and I like the central idea of your body not being an apology, but I found it pretty repetitive, and I also, I, also I kind of just wanted more practical advice, right? Because, like, you can be on board with the idea that your body is not an apology, but I think maybe even more important is how to keep or remember that, keep that in mind when you're in a world where you're sort of constantly um, assaulted with the, the notion that, no, you should apologize for being fat or for not being, you know, a size whatever. Um, and then Sonia Renee Taylor does at the end of the book give sort of 10 practical um, tools or, or steps you can take or something like that. And, and those I liked and I kind of wish the whole book was centered around the 10 tips um, because I just felt like, again, it's it's not, I don't, personally for me, I don't think it's all that hard to be on board with the idea that you shouldn't have to apologize for your body, but yeah, I just wanted sort of more practical um, advice and application than it gave me. Um, the other thing is that she often uses the word body or the phrase body terrorism um, as a sort of stand-in for body shame or, um, you know, things that we see on, on online and in the media and stuff like that, that that make us ashamed of our bodies if we're fat. Um, and I didn't like the use, the repeated use of that phrase, especially because Sonia Renee Taylor takes a very intersectional approach in this book. And I feel like there are a number of people who actually do suffer from body terrorism. That is, you know, sort of constant low-level fear of, of being violated or being even killed simply because of the body they inhabit. Like, say, for example, people of color or um, women or queer people or trans people. Um, and I just feel like to use the phrase body terrorism and associate it with like body shaming, I, I just feel like it sort of cheapens the phrase. Um, so anyway, so I ended up giving it three stars. I did like the concept and I did like the 10 practical tools that she talks about at the end, but the, a lot of it I just felt like was kind of repetitive. Um, and like I said, I also had a problem with the use of the phrase body terrorism, which I just talked about. So. Um, so yeah, so three stars. So then I read a very short little humorous book that I own called How to Be a Jewish Mother. Um, and this was a very quick read. I read it in one day. Um, and yeah, it's just, you know, funny stuff like how to overfeed your guests. And if something good happens, you have to point out the negative side. And if something bad happens, you have to point out the positive side, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, oh, the other thing I really like that I wanted to share is the distinction that's made in the glossary between um, three different kinds of boys. So um, the first one is a nice boy, a young man who owns his own car. A good boy, a young man who owns his own car and brings his date's mother candy. A fine boy, a young man who owns his own car, brings his date's mother candy and studies medicine. <laughs> so. I, um, so I thought a lot of this was humorous. Um, the chapter on when your kids date and get married definitely was a little dated and cringy, but considering the fact this book was published in the 1960s, I think that's, that's probably to be expected. So three and a half stars. I was entertained. It was a light reading. Um, I also finished this past week Daniel Silva's The Rembrandt Affair, which is the 10th book in the Gabriel Elon series. 
Um, and I was a little concerned when I did my August TBR, I was a little concerned about this one because I had liked the defector so well that I was kind of thinking, ah, there's no way the Rembrandt Fair will live up to this. Well, I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised that it, it did almost, in fact, live up to the preceding novel in the series. So, um, in this book, um, Daniel Silva explores some territory that he had not returned to since the second, third, and fourth books in the series, all of which deal with the unfinished business of the Holocaust, and he returns to that again in this book, um, which I liked. I feel like he kind of does his best work when he's dealing um, with the unfinished business of the Holocaust. Um, so this has to do with a stolen Rembrandt painting that was stolen during um, the Second World War and eventually made its its way into the hands of, of other people and um, with a secret list of Swiss bank accounts that was hidden along with the painting um, and how a contemporary you know billionaire who looks like a saint um, has kind of made his money off of, of the, the same um, theft of, of painting and, and money from these Swiss bank accounts. Um, it did get a little in the weeds for me at times, the connection between the Rembrandt painting and the billionaire guy that they're after. Um, but, uh, but overall, I was entertained. It was plotty, fast-paced, a page-turner, as all of these books are. Um, and I quite enjoyed it overall, so 3.75 stars. Um, I also, this week, finished The Plot by Jean Hand Korolitz. Um, and I think you say it Jean Hanf Korolitz because that's the way the audiobook narrator said it, so that's what I'm going to say. Um, and I did listen to this as an audiobook, so I don't have it here to hold, and hold up and show you. Um, this was highly entertaining. <laughs> I gave this book four stars. Um, it is about a, an author and a teacher of creative writing named Jacob Finch Bonner, who is, when the book opens, he's teaching at a low residency. MFA program and he gets this student named Evan Parker who doesn't really seem to want to take advantage of the creative writing program or the fiction workshop. He's very guarded about the plot of his novel in progress um, because he insists that you know this is just going to be really good and you know no one could possibly mess this up and whenever he does finally finish the novel like it's going to be a bestseller, it's going to be an Oprah's book club pick, it's going to be made into a movie, etc, etc, and um, Jacob Finch Bonner, the main character, is kind of just like, mm, yeah, okay, right, whatever, kid. <laughs> but then the guy comes to see him in his office one day and actually tells him the um, intended plot of his novel, and Jacob is basically like, oh my god, I can't believe that this guy's right, he really does have something here. Um, so then, you know, fast forward a few years later and Jacob no longer teaches in the program and he's doing something else and occasionally he keeps sort of, you know, checking online to see if this, this guy's novel has come out, um, but he hasn't seen it yet and so eventually he decides to do some research and he realizes that his former student has died and not long after he was in the um, program. And so being a writer, um, Jacob decides that he's going to use the plot that he heard about from his student and he turns it into a best-selling novel, Oprah's book club, club pick, option in a movie, etc, etc, um, that his student had, had planned. Um, and then, of course, he starts getting threatening emails and social media messages telling him that he's a thief and a plagiarist and stuff like that. So. Um, so that's basically the setup of this, and again, I found it very entertaining. Um, I liked the sort of cat and mouse nature of it. Um, I did find that it dragged a little bit when Jacob is going around to all these different people trying to find out information about his former student, but at a certain point, it then became comical to me because it was just like, it was just so absurd. <laughs> so, um, the other thing I liked about this book is I, I kind of like that the male characters were all a little bumbling, not gonna lie. <laughs> so, so I appreciated that aspect of it too. But yeah, anyway, this was very fun, light, summer reading. Um, also was fun playing like spot the literary reference because there are references made to a bunch of other works in this book. 
Um, so that was that was enjoyable and entertaining. I would recommend it if you like a slow burn kind of thriller. Um, so yeah, four stars. Really liked it. Would definitely read more stuff by Jean Han Corlitz. Um, and then the last book that I finished this past week was Homie by Denez Smith. Um, this is a collection of poetry. I previously had read Denez Smith's um, earlier collection, Don't Call Us Dead, um, and liked that fine. And I felt similarly about Homie, so I ended up giving this volume three and a half stars. I did like it, and I did like some of the poems in here, but I'm a little surprised that I did not like it more because in this volume, the poems are, I think, more experimental than they were in Don't Call Us Dead, and I usually really like that. Um, so I had to really sit and think about why I didn't like this more. And I think it's because there's such extremes of tone within an individual poem. So, you know, at, at, like the beginning of this poem called Dogs, for example, um, Denez Smith writes, if I can find the poem, would have been good if I'd marked that. Okay, so at the beginning of Dog, Smith writes, Scooby-Doo was trying to tell us something when every time that monster mask got snatched off, it was a greedy white dude. So, like, you kind of think from that beginning, okay, well, this is set kind of a serious, um, not totally serious, but, you know, it's set a, you know, observational tone, you're going to give me some kind of social commentary or something like that. And then, you know, in the very next um, stanza, Smith writes, in 97, a black comic gets on stage and says, you ever notice how white dogs be like woof woof and black dogs be like rough rough motherfucker? And then later on, um, Smith juxtaposes that rough rough motherfucker um, down at the bottom as if, it's a, as if it's a dog barking. And I just felt like I didn't really know what to do with that <laughs> because... You know, on the one hand, you've got some sort of more serious social commentary going on, but then on the other hand, you have this really sort of linguistically playful stuff happening. And I wasn't sure if perhaps that was indicative of Smith's own feelings about things going on in their life, how on the one hand, they have this very somber and serious stuff going on because this is also about friends of theirs who have died um, and about their own struggle and, and illness, um, but, you know, but on the other hand it has this very linguistically playful side to it, and so I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be a representation of Smith's own state of mind um, or not, but I did enjoy it overall. Um, I probably would still recommend it if you like contemporary poetry, um, especially sort of more experimental poetry. But yeah, I just wasn't sure what to do with so many poems that sort of took me from one extreme to the other of being serious, but then also being very sort of playful and, and joyous. Um, there were a few poems in here that I quite liked. Those tended to be ones that were more sort of consistent in tone. Um, and one of them that I will read here is called Fall Poem. Fall Poem. The leaves done done their annual shimmy, now the street light with no soft green curtain cuts a silver blade across my bed and my body. I didn't want to start with leaves, even though I love how the trees turn the color of ants and soul train line to the ground each October. No one wants to hear a poem about fall. Much prefer the fallen body, something easy to mourn. Body cut out of the light, body lit up with bullets. See how easy it is to bring up bullets? Is it possible to ban guns? even from this poem. I lie in the light, body split by light, room too bright for sleep, thinking of the leaf-colored bodies, their weekly fall, how their bodies look like mounds of a tree's shed skin. A child could jump into them and play for hours. There I go, talking about our dead, and if you don't think they are your dead, I've run from your hands. They are red, like the tree down the street, a hot air balloon of blood, the leaves dyed fruit punch red, red as a child's red mouth, after an afternoon spent on the porch with a bag of tackies, watching other kids walk by, waiting for kids who don't pass anymore on the other side of summer, who maybe go to a different school, or moved out east, or made like a tree, and now sleep in a box made from one." Um, so that I found a very powerful poem, um, and there were several poems in here 
like that. So we did like some of the poems, but just others and I wasn't quite sure what to do with these extremes in, um, in tone. So gave this three and a half stars. So, okay, that's everything I finished. So on to currently reading. Um, I'm still reading The Mothers brought by Britt Bennett. This is her debut novel. I have about 50 pages left in this. Um, and this is still going well so far, so I'm sure I will have stuff to say when I wrap this up next week. Um, I also started reading Arabian Jazz by Diana Abu Jaber, um, and this is for my own personal Arab American literature project where every month I read one book written by an Arab American writer this year. Um, Diana Abu Jaber is of Jordanian and Palestinian descent, I believe. Um, so this is a book, <clears throat> I'm not too far into this, I'm only about 50 pages in right now, but um, this is a book about a man who lives in upstate New York, um, and his wife has died, and he has two grown daughters, and the two daughters, um, you know, are sort of trying to figure out how to navigate their lives, especially with their father who's, he's not old yet, but he's getting older, and then they have an aunt who's worried about how they're going to be spinsters because they haven't been married off yet, etc, etc, so it's sort of like, seems like a little family drama kind of thing, so that's interesting so far. Um, I also picked up an ebook, um, which is Blood Child and Other Stories by Octavia Butler. Um, and I've read two stories in it so far. I've read the title story and I've read the second story. The title story, Blood Child, I've actually read and taught previously. Um, this edition of the book is interesting because after each story, it has a very short afterword that was written by Octavia Butler where she sort of talks about her um, motivations in writing the stories. And I'm finding that quite interesting so far. So that's, um, so that's also a, a book that I'm working on. Um, I also started this past week Mendelssohn is on the Roof by Yerzy Weil. Yerzy Weil was a Jewish Czech writer um, and this is essentially about um, Prague uh, under Nazi occupation um, and it starts off with um, the this aspiring SS officer being tasked with pulling down a statue of Jewish composer Felix Mendelssohn from um, the roof of the Prague uh, Opera House, I believe. Except the problem is he doesn't know which one is Mendelssohn, <laughs> and so he tells his men to pull down the statue with the biggest nose, but when they do that he realizes that it was actually Richard Wagner instead. Um, and the story kind of takes off from there, and thus far it has shown the Nazis to be both petty and incompetent, and I'm kind of here for that. So. <laughs> so that's going well, and then I'm also still reading The Essential Writings of Ralph Waldo Emerson. I am 360 pages into this, so if I continue with my current plan, by the end of this month I should be halfway through this book, which is very exciting. Okay, so that is everything that I either finished this week or am currently reading. If you have thoughts about any of these books, I would love to hear that. Please feel free to let me know that down in the comments below. Thank you for watching this. I hope everyone is staying healthy and well. I hope you're doing good reading whatever you're reading. And until next time, what a kill you do, volume mama.